Chapter 2 The Fall of House de Vere Dinan noted with satisfaction that any of the meandering bugbears, or any other of the multitude of races that composed Menzo Baranzen, drow included, now made great haste to scurry out of his way. This time the second boy of House de Urden was not alone. Nearly sixty soldiers of the house walked in tight lines behind him. Behind these, in similar order, though with far less enthusiasm for the adventure, came a hundred armed slaves of lesser races, goblins, orcs, and bugbears. There could be no doubt for onlookers. A drow house was on a march to war. This was not an everyday event in Menzo Baranzen, but neither was it unexpected. At least once every decade, a house decided that its position within the city hierarchy could be improved by another house's elimination. It was a risky proposition, for all of the nobles of the victim house had to be disposed of quickly and quietly. If even one survived to lay an accusation upon the perpetrator, the attacking house would be eradicated by Menzo Baranzen's merciless system of justice. If the raid was executed to devious perfection, though, no recourse would be forthcoming. All of the city, even the ruling council of the top eight matron mothers, would secretly applaud the attackers for their courage and intelligence, and no more would ever be said of the incident. Dinan took a roundabout route, not wanting to lay a direct trail between House Doerden and House de Vere. A half hour later, for the second time that night, he crept to the mushroom grove's southern end, to the cluster of stalagmites that held House de Vere. His soldiers streamed out behind him eagerly, readying weapons and taking full measure of the structure before them. The slaves were slower in their movements. Many of them looked about for some escape, for they knew in their hearts that they were doomed in this battle. They feared the wrath of the Dark Elves more than death itself, though, and would not attempt to flee. With every exit out of Menzo Baranzen protected by devious drow magic, where could they possibly go? Every one of them had witnessed the brutal punishments the drow elves exacted on recaptured slaves. At Dinan's command, they jumped into their positions around the mushroom fence. Dinan reached into his large pouch and pulled out a heated sheet of metal. He flashed the object, brightened in the infrared spectrum three times behind him to signal the approaching brigades of Nalfane and Risen. Then, with his usual cockiness, Dinan spun it quickly into the air, caught it, and replaced it into the secrecy of his heat-shielding pouch. On cue with the twirling signal, Dinan's drow brigade fitted enchanted darts to their tiny handheld crossbows and took aim on the appointed targets. Every fifth mushroom was a shrieker, and every dart held a magical dweamer that could silence the roar of a dragon. Two, three, Dinan counted, his hand signaling the tempo since no words could be heard within the sphere of magical silence cast about his troops. He imagined the click as the drawn string on his little weapon released, loosing the dart into the nearest shrieker. So it went all around the cluster of House de Vere, the first line of alarm systematically silenced by three dozen enchanted darts. Halfway across Menzo Baranzen, Matron Malice, her daughters, and four of the house's common clerics were gathered in Lolth's unholy circle of eight. They ringed an idol of their wicked deity, a gemstone carving of a drow-faced spider, and called to Lolth for aid in their struggles. Malice sat at the head, propped in a chair angled for birthing. Brisa and Vierna flanked her, Brisa clutching her hand. The select group chanted in unison, combining their energies into a single offensive spell. A moment later, when Vierna, mentally linked to Dinan, Understood that the first attack group was in position, the Doerden Circle of Eight sent the first insinuating waves of mental energy into the rival house. Matron Ginefe, her two daughters, and the five principal clerics of the common troops of House de Vere huddled together in the darkened anteroom of the five stalagmite houses' main chapel. 
They had gathered there in solemn prayer every night since matron Gina Fay had learned that she had fallen into Lolth's disfavor. Gina Fay understood how vulnerable her house remained until she could find a way to appease the Spider Queen. There were sixty-six other houses in Menzo Baranzen, fully twenty of which might dare to attack House de Vere at such an obvious disadvantage. The eight clerics were anxious now, somehow suspecting that this night would be eventful. Gina Fay felt it first, a chilling blast of confusing perceptions that caused her to stutter over her prayers of forgiveness. The other clerics of House de Vere glanced nervously at the matron's uncharacteristic slip of words, looking for confirmation. We are under attack, Gina Fay breathed to them, her head already pounding with a dull ache under the growing assault of the formidable clerics of House de Erden. A second signal from Dinan put the slave troops into motion. Still using stealth as their ally, they quietly rushed to the mushroom fence and cut through with wide-bladed swords. The second boy of House de Erden watched and enjoyed as the courtyard of House de Vere was easily penetrated. Not such a prepared guard, he whispered in silent sarcasm to the red glowing gargoyles on the high walls. The statues had seemed such an ominous guard earlier that night. Now, they just watched helplessly. Dinan recognized the measured but growing anticipation in the soldiers around him. Their drow battle lust was barely contained. Every now and then came a killing flash as one of the slaves stumbled over a warding glyph, but the second boy and the other drow only laughed at the spectacle. The lesser races were the expendable fodder of House Do Erden's army. The only purpose in bringing the goblinoids to House de Vere was to trigger the deadly traps and defenses along the perimeter to lead the way for the drow elves, the true soldiers. The fence was now opened and secrecy was thrown away. House de Vere's soldiers met the invading slaves head-on within the compound. Dinan barely had his hand up to begin the attack command when his sixty anxious drow warriors jumped up and charged, their faces twisted in wicked glee and their weapons waving menacingly. They halted their approach on cue, though, remembering one final task set out to them. Every drow, noble or commoner, possessed certain magical abilities. Bringing forth a globe of darkness, as Dinan had done to the bugbears in the street earlier that night, came easily to even the lowliest of the dark elves. So it went now, with sixty doored and soldiers blotting out the perimeter of House de Vere above the mushroom fence in ball after ball of blackness. For all their stealth and precautions, House Doerden knew that many eyes were watching the raid. Witnesses were not too much of a problem, they could not, or would not, care enough to identify the attacking house, but custom and rules demanded that certain attempts at secrecy be enacted, the etiquette of drow warfare. In the blink of a red glowing drow eye, House de Vere became, to the rest of the city, a dark blot on Menzo Baranzen's landscape. Risen came up behind his youngest son. Well done, he signaled in the intricate finger language of the drow. Nalfane is in through the back. An easy victory, the cocky Dinan signaled back, if matron Gina Fay and her clerics are held at bay. Trust in matron Malice, was Risen's response. He clapped his son's shoulder and followed his troops in through the breached mushroom fence. High above the cluster of House de Vere, Zachnafane rested comfortably in the current arms of Brisa's aerial servant, watching the drama unfold. From this vantage, Zach could see within the ring of darkness and could hear within the ring of magical silence. Dinan's troops, the first drow soldiers in, had met resistance at every door and were being beaten badly. Nalfane and his brigade the troops of House Do Erden most practiced in the ways of wizardry came through the fence at the rear of the complex. Lightning strikes and magical balls of acid thundered into the courtyard at the base of the De Vere structures, cutting down Do Erden fodder and De Vere defenses alike. In the front courtyard, 
Risen and Dinan commanded the finest fighters of House Do Erdin. The blessings of Lolth were with his house, Zack could see when the battle was fully joined, for the strikes of the soldiers of House Do Erdin came faster than those of their enemies, and their aim proved more deadly. In minutes, the battle had been taken fully inside the five pillars. Zack stretched the incessant chill out of his arms and willed the aerial servant to action. Down he plummeted on his windy bed, and then he fell free the last few feet to the terrace along the top chambers of the central pillar. At once, two guards, one a female, rushed out to greet him. They hesitated in confusion, though, trying to sort out the true form of this unremarkable gray blur. Too long. They had never heard of Zachnafane do Erdin. They didn't know that death was upon them. Zack's whip flashed out, catching and gashing the female's throat, while his other hand walked his sword through a series of masterful thrusts and parries that put the male off balance. Zack finished both in a single blurring movement, snapping the whip-entwined female from the terrace with a twist of his wrist and spinning a kick into the male's face that likewise dropped him to the cavern floor. Zack was then inside, where another guard rose up to meet him, but fell at his feet. Zack slipped along the curving wall of the stalactite tower, his cooled body blending perfectly with the stone. Soldiers of House de Vere rushed all about him, trying to formulate some defense against the host of intruders who had already won out the lowest level of every structure and had taken two of the pillars completely. Zack was not concerned with them. He blocked out the clanging ring of adamantite weapons, the cries of command, and the screams of death, concentrating instead on a singular sound that would lead him to his destination, a unified, frantic chant. He found an empty corridor covered with spider carvings and running into the center of the pillar. As in House Doerden, this corridor ended in a large set of ornate double doors, their decorations dominated by arachnid forms. This must be the place, Zack muttered under his breath, fitting his hood to the top of his head. A giant spider rushed out of its concealment to his side. Zack dove to his belly and kicked out under the thing, spinning into a roll that plunged his sword deep into the monster's bulbous body. Sticky fluids gushed out over the weapon master, and the spider shuddered to a quick death. Yes, Zack whispered, wiping the spider juices from his face. This must be the place. He pulled the dead monster back into its hidden cubby and slipped in beside the thing, hoping that no one had noticed the brief struggle. By the sounds of ringing weapons, Zack could tell that the fighting had almost reached this floor. House de Vere now seemed to have its defenses in place, though, and was finally holding its ground. Now, Malice, Zack whispered, hoping that Breeza, attuned to him in the meld, would sense his anxiety. Let us not be late. Back in the clerical anteroom of House Do Erdin, Malice and her subordinates continued their brutal mental assault on the clerics of House de Vere. Lolth heard their prayers louder than those of their counterparts, giving the clerics of House Do Erdin the stronger spells in their mental combat. Already they had easily put their enemies into a defensive posture. One of the lesser priestesses in De Vere's Circle of Eight had been crushed by Breeza's mental insinuations, and now lay dead on the floor barely inches from Matron Gina Fey's feet. But the momentum had slowed suddenly, and the battle seemed to be swinging back to an even level. Matron Malice, struggling with the impending birth, could not hold her concentration, and without her voice, the spells of her unholy circle weakened. At her mother's side, powerful Breeza clutched her mother's hand so tightly that all the blood was squeezed from it, leaving it cool, the only cool spot on the laboring female, to the eyes of the others. Breeza studied the contractions and the crowning cap of the coming child's white hair, and calculated the time to the moment of birth. 
This technique of translating the pain of birth into an offensive spell attack had never been tried before except in legend, and Breeza knew that timing would be the critical factor. She whispered into her mother's ear, coaxing out the words of a deadly incantation. Matron Malice echoed back the beginnings of the spell, sublimating her gasps and transforming her rage of agony into offensive power. Din in duard ma brechentol, Breeza implored. Din in duard ma brechentol, Malice growled, so determined to focus through the pain that she bit through one of her thin lips. The baby's head appeared, more fully this time, and this time to stay. Breeza trembled and could barely remember the incantation herself. She whispered the final rune into the matron's ear, almost fearing the consequences. Malice gathered her breath and her courage. She could feel the tingling of the spell as clearly as the pain of the birth. To her daughters standing around the idol, staring at her in disbelief, she appeared as a red blur of heated fury, streaking sweat lines that shone as brightly as the heat of boiling water. Abek, the matron began, feeling the pressure building to a crescendo. Abek, she felt the hot tear of her skin, the sudden slippery release as the baby's head pushed through the sudden ecstasy of birthing. Abek din abreg duard, Malice screamed, pushing away all of the agony in a final explosion of magical power that knocked even the clerics of her own house from their feet. Carried on the thrust of Matron Malice's exultation, the Dweemer thundered into the chapel of House Devere, shattered the gemstone idol of Lolth, sundered the double doors into heaps of twisted metal, and threw Matron Genefe and her overmatched subordinates to the floor. Zack shook his head in disbelief as the chapel doors flew past him. Quite a kick, Malice, he chuckled, and spun around the entryway into the chapel. Using his infravision, he took a quick survey and head count of the lightless room's seven living occupants, all struggling back to their feet, their robes tattered. Again shaking his head at the bared power of matron malice, Zack pulled his hood down over his face. A snap of his whip was the only explanation he offered as he smashed a tiny ceramic globe at his feet, the sphere shattered, dropping out a pellet that Breeza had enchanted for just such occasions, a pellet glowing with the brightness of daylight. For eyes accustomed to blackness, tuned in to heat emanations, the intrusion of such radiance came in a blinding flash of agony. The cleric's cries of pain only aided Zack in his systematic trek around the room, and he smiled widely under his hood every time he felt his sword bite into drow flesh. He heard the beginnings of a spell across the way and knew that one of the Deveres had recovered enough from the assault to be dangerous. The weapon master did not need his eyes to aim, however, and the crack of his whip took Matron Genefe's tongue right out of her mouth. Breeza placed the newborn on the back of the spider idol, and lifted the ceremonial dagger, pausing to admire its cruel workmanship. Its hilt was a spider's body sporting eight legs, barbed so as to appear furred, but angled down to serve as blades. Breeza lifted the instrument above the baby's chest. Name the child, she implored her mother. The spider queen will not accept the sacrifice until the child is named. Matron Malice lolled her head, trying to fathom her daughter's meaning. The matron mother had thrown everything into the moment of the spell and the birth, and she was now barely coherent. Name the child, Breeza commanded, anxious to feed her hungry goddess. Ah, it nears its end, Dinin said to his brother when they met in a lower hall of one of the lesser pillars of House Devere. Risen is winning through to the top, and it is believed that Zach Nathane's dark work has been completed. Two score of House Devere's soldiers have already turned allegiance to us, 
Nalfane replied. They see the end, laughed Dinan. One house serves them as well as another, and in the eyes of commoners, no house is worth dying for. Our task will be finished soon. Too quickly for anyone to take note, Nalfane said. Now Doerden Dyerman Nashes Bernon is the ninth house of Menzoboranzen, and Devere be damned. Alert, Dinan cried suddenly, eyes widening in feigned horror as he looked over his brother's shoulder. Nalfane reacted immediately, spinning to face the danger at his back, only to put the true danger at his back. For even as Nalfane realized the deception, Dinan's sword slipped into his spine. Dinan put his head to his brother's shoulder and pressed his cheek to Nalfane's, watching the red sparkle of heat leave his brother's eyes. Too quickly for anyone to take note, Dinan teased, echoing his brother's earlier words. He dropped the lifeless form to his feet. Now Dinan is the elder boy of House Doerden, and Nalfane be damned. Drizzt, breathed Matron Malice. The child's name is Drizzt. Breeza tightened her grip on the knife and began the ritual. Queen of spiders, take this babe, she began. She raised the dagger to strike. Drizzt, Do Erden, we give you in payment for our glorious vic- Wait, called Maya from the side of the room. Her melding with her brother Nalfane had abruptly ceased. It could only mean one thing. Nalfane is dead, she announced. The baby is no longer the third living son. Vierna glanced curiously at her sister. At the same instant that Maya had sensed Nalfane's death, Vierna, melded with Dinan, had felt a strong emotive surge. Elation? Vierna brought a slender finger up to her pursed lips, wondering if Dinan had successfully pulled off the assassination. Breeza still held the spider-shaped knife over the babe's chest, wanting to give this one to Lolth. We promised the Spider Queen the third living son, Maya warned, and that has been given. But not in sacrifice, argued Breeza. Vierna shrugged at a loss. If Lolth accepted Nalfane, then he has been given. To give another might evoke the Spider Queen's anger. But to not give what we have promised would be worse still, Breeza insisted. Then finish the deed, said Maya. Breeza clenched down tight on the dagger and began the ritual again. Stay your hand, Matron Malice commanded, propping herself up in the chair. Lolth is content. Our victory is won. Welcome then your brother, the newest member of House Doerden. Just a male, Breeza commented in obvious disgust, walking away from the idol and the child. Next time we shall do better, Matron Malice chuckled, though she wondered if there would be a next time. She approached the end of her fifth century of life, and drow elves, even young ones, were not a particularly fruitful lot. Breeza had been born to Malice at the youthful age of one hundred, but in the almost four centuries since, Malice had produced only five other children. Even this baby, Drizzt, had come as a surprise, and Malice hardly expected that she would ever conceive again. Enough of such contemplations, Malice whispered to herself, exhausted. There will be ample time. She sank back into her chair and fell into fitful, though wickedly pleasant, dreams of heightening power. Zachnafane walked through the central pillar of the Devere complex, his hood in his hand and his whip and sword comfortably replaced on his belt. Every now and then a ring of battle sounded, only to be quickly ended. House Doerden had rolled through to victory, the tenth house had taken the fourth, and now all that remained was to remove evidence and witnesses. One group of lesser female clerics marched through, 
tending to the wounded Doerdens and animating the corpses of those beyond their ability so that the bodies could walk away from the crime scene. Back at the Doerden compound, those corpses not beyond repair would be resurrected and put back to work. Zack turned away with a visible shudder as the clerics moved from room to room, the marching line of Doerden zombies growing ever longer at their backs. As distasteful as Zacnafane found this troop, the one that followed was even worse. Two Doerden clerics led a contingent of soldiers through the structure, using detection spells to determine hiding places of surviving Deveres. One stopped in the hallway just a few steps from Zack, her eyes turned inward as she felt the emanations of her spell. She held her fingers out in front of her, tracing a slow line like some macabre divining rod toward drow flesh. In there, she declared, pointing to a panel at the base of the wall. The soldiers jumped to it like a pack of ravenous wolves and tore through the secret door. Inside a hidden cubby huddled the children of House Devere. These were nobles, not commoners, and could not be taken alive. Zack quickened his pace to get beyond the scene, but he heard vividly the children's helpless screams as the hungry Doerden soldiers finished their job. Zack found himself in a run now. He rushed around a bend in the hallway, nearly bowling over Dinin and Rizen. Nalfain is dead, Rizen declared impassively. Zack immediately turned a suspicious eye on the younger Doerden son. I killed the Devere soldier who committed the deed, Dinin assured him, not even hiding his cocky smile. Zack had been around for nearly four centuries, and he was certainly not ignorant of the ways of his ambitious race. The brother princes had come in defensively at the back of the lines, with a host of Doerden soldiers between them and the enemy. By the time they even encountered a drow that was not of their own house, the majority of the Devere's surviving soldiers had already switched allegiance to House Doerden. Zack doubted that either of the Doerden brothers had even seen action against a Devere. The description of the carnage in the prayer room has been spread throughout the ranks, Risen said to the weapon master. You performed with your usual excellence, as we have come to expect. Zack shot the patron a glare of contempt and kept on his way, down through the structure's main doors and out beyond the magical darkness and silence into Menzo Baranzen's dark dawn. Risen was Matron Malice's present partner in a long line of partners, and no more. When Malice was finished with him, she would either relegate him back to the ranks of the common soldiery, stripping him of the name Doerden and all the rights that accompanied it, or she would dispose of him. Zack owed him no respect. Zack moved out beyond the mushroom fence to the highest vantage point he could find, then fell to the ground. He watched amazed a few moments later when the procession of the Doerden army, patron and son, soldiers and clerics, and the slow-moving line of two dozen drow zombies made its way back home. They had lost and left behind nearly all of their slave fodder in the attack, but the line leaving the wreckage of House Devere was longer than the line that had come in earlier that night. The slaves had been replaced twofold by captured Devere slaves, and fifty or more of the Devere common troops, showing typical drow loyalty, had willingly joined the attackers. These traitorous drow would be interrogated, magically interrogated, by the Doerden clerics to ensure their sincerity. They would pass the test to a one, Zack knew. Drow elves were creatures of survival, not of principle. The soldiers would be given new identities and would be kept within the privacy of the Doerden compound for a few months until the fall of House Devere became an old and forgotten tale. Zack did not follow immediately. Rather, he cut through the rows of mushroom trees and found a secluded dell where he plopped down on a patch of mossy carpet and raised his gaze to the eternal darkness of the cavern's ceiling and the eternal darkness of his existence. It would have been prudent for him to remain silent at that time. He was an invader to the most powerful section of the vast city. 
He thought of the possible witnesses to his words, the same dark elves who had watched the fall of House de Vere, who had wholeheartedly enjoyed the spectacle. In the face of such behavior and such carnage as this knight had seen, Zack could not contain his emotions. His lament came out as a plea to some god beyond his experience. What place is this that is my world? What dark coil has my spirit embodied? He whispered the angry disclaimer that had always been a part of him. In light I see my skin as black. In darkness it glows white in the heat of this rage I cannot dismiss. Would that I had the courage to depart this place or this life or to stand openly against the wrongness that is the world of these my kin to seek an existence that does not run afoul to that which I believe and to that which I hold dear faith is truth Zach Nathane do Erden I am called yet a drow I am not by choice or by deed let them discover this being that I am then <sighs> Let them rain their wrath on these old shoulders already burdened by the hopelessness of Benzo Bronson. Ignoring the consequences, the weapon master rose to his feet and yelled, Menzo Bronson, what hell are you? A moment later, when no answer echoed back out of the quiet city, Zack flexed the remaining chill of Breeza's wand from his weary muscles. He found some comfort as he patted the whip on his belt. The instrument had taken the tongue from the mouth of a matron mother. <laughs>